morning. Happy Sabbath. It's a pleasure to be back here at Heartland. It's been a little while. I'm thankful for the privilege. I uh, got in a little bit late last night. I missed, I'm sure it was a blessing last night with Dr. Taylor, and I trust the Lord has many more blessings in store for us throughout this weekend. Our topic this morning, educating royalty. We're going to look at some of these basic principles of the plan of education that God has given us. Um, as I mentioned, I got in late last night. I don't know what, was, what Dr. Taylor covered last night. Hopefully there's not too much overlap. But then again, repetition deepens impression, right? Sometimes it's good to hear these truths over and over again. I would invite you to bow your heads with prayer as we start. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come this morning recognizing our weakness, recognizing that we need your help, that we need your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray this morning that you'll teach us, that you'll open our hearts and minds to receive your truth. Lord, may your spirit be here. May your angels be around this place. Please speak through me. I pray my words will be from you. This message will be from you. And I ask in Jesus' name. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 16, Romans chapter 8, 16, are we all there? Amen. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be also glorified together. What does the Bible call us in verse 16? Children of, of God. Children of God. Heirs of God. Joint heirs with Christ. Children of a king is what the Bible says. Now, what do we call in this world today the child of a king? A prince or a princess, right? What do we call the family of a king? Royalty. So according to the Bible, we are royalty because we are children of God. We are heirs of an eternal kingdom. Now, if we look in the world today at the families of royalty, we find something very interesting. They are extremely careful about the education they give their children. They don't just send them off anywhere and hope they get a good education. No, they make sure that their children are receiving a proper education. Why? Because they have a high calling. They have an important destiny to fill, and they want to make sure that their children and their young people are prepared to take this role of responsibility as heirs to a kingdom. And the Bible here tells us that we are heirs of a kingdom, but not just any kingdom. The king of the universe has called us his children. And do you think that if the king of the universe has spelled out any plan of education which he wants his children to follow to prepare them to take their role of responsibility in the kingdom of heaven, do you think we'd best pay attention? <laughs> I think so. So we're going to talk about that this morning. This plan that the king of the universe has outlined to prepare us for this position that Romans chapter 8 has, has explained to us. But I want to begin with a little preface, because when we talk about true education, the natural response that comes into the mind uh, for many of us is, well, <laughs> I'm not a teacher. This doesn't apply to me. <laughs> or maybe, well, I, 
you know, I'm past that stage of dealing with my young children, so really this doesn't apply to me. All right, let's determine who true education applies to. Does it apply to teachers, yes or no? Clearly, it applies to teachers. Does it apply to families? Clearly, it applies to families. In fact, we are told, the Avenus Home 182, that in his wisdom, the Lord has decreed that the family shall be the greatest of all educational agencies. Now, that word greatest is interesting. So yes, true education applies to teachers, but it applies even more to the family. But is it just for teachers, just for parents, just for those working with children? <laughs> no, not that either. For we read in the School of Christ, students are never graduated. How many here are in the School of Christ? I hope every hand should go up, right? We want to be in the School of Christ. And right here, we find a fundamental difference between true education and false education. In the education of the world, what is the number one thing that students look forward to? Graduation, right? I can complete my education. And the Lord tells us here, no, in my school, you don't graduate. This plan of learning goes on for eternity. Now, that could be a little discouraging, right? Some of you, are, you know, you're, you're a little downcast on face right now, right? Like, uh, really? I never finish? <laughs> Hey, that should be encouraging. The fact that we get to learn from the greatest teacher, Jesus himself, for eternity, should be encouraging to us. Among the pupils are both old and young. Those who give heed to the instructions of the divine teacher constantly advance in wisdom, refinement, and nobility of soul, and thus they are prepared to enter that higher school where advancement will continue throughout eternity. The point is this, this plan of true education applies to every single one of us, whether we're a teacher, whether we're a parent, whether we're a grandparent, whether we're not even working with children, that's not the point. The point is this plan of education applies to every one of us because it is about fitting us for this destiny that we just read about in Romans, preparing us to be heirs of God joint heirs with Jesus. Oh, but there's more. In the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. Who wants to be redeemed? The work of education, true education, and the work of redemption are one. This applies to every one of us. But then there's a statement that I'm sure many of us are familiar with I know many of these topics we're discussing this morning are familiar to many of us. Now, as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. Now, when I first read this, I thought, wow, true education is important. And I read it again, and I, I understood more of its importance. And as I studied and as I contemplated this and I heard this over the years, I realized just how important it is. And I realized there are three very important uh, points that we can pull from this statement. Probably more. You might think of others. I want to mention three very important ones. First of all, this tells us something about the content of God's plan of education called true education. Because it says that it is essential for us to understand it to be able to enter the kingdom of God. So whatever the content is, it must mean that it is preparing us for heaven. So does true education only concern itself with math and science and history and those academic subjects? Or might there be more than that? There's more than that. I'm not saying those aren't important. But God has not made algebra an entrance requirement for heaven. I should have heard some praise the Lord's and amens. A lot of us wouldn't make it, right? <laughs> Those things might be helpful preparation for earth, depending on what the Lord has called you into. But the true science of education involves more than just the academic subjects because it is preparation for eternity. There's something else this tells us. It says now, as never before, we need to understand this. In other words, it used to be important, but now it's more important than ever. Or we could say, this is urgent. This is urgent. Why so urgent? <laughs> Why so urgent? Well, at its, at its basic level, if it involves preparing us for heaven, 
who believes Jesus is coming soon. So that makes it urgent, right? <laughs> but there's more than that. I'm going to talk about this tonight. But why did, the, why did the nation of Israel reject Jesus as the Messiah? As we're going to study tonight, it was a direct result of false education. Do you think that if Satan worked hard to get the Jewish nation to follow false education so that they would not recognize Jesus when he came the first time, do you think Satan might work extra hard in the last days with the professed people of God to get them to follow false education again so that they would not be ready to recognize Jesus when he comes the second time? True education is important for us now as it never has been in history. And there is a third point I want to draw from this statement of true education, and that is, if it is so important for us to understand to enter heaven, do you think it is something very complicated that only a few people can access? If true education is essential to enter heaven, it must be simple enough for every child of God to understand and to follow. We like to overcomplicate this plan of education. As I heard um, someone refer to an, another topic of, of um, God's principles, he said it is both simple and complicated. God made it simple, and we make it complicated. <laughs> God has made this plan of education simple because it needs to be accessible to everyone. And sometimes we think, oh, you have to have this curriculum and that program and this training and all these different things, when God says, no, the plan of true education is about preparing you to enter heaven, and that is something everyone can access. That should be encouraging to all of us. We can all follow the plan of true education. Because, again, we're educating royalty. The king has given us instruction on how to prepare little princes and princesses, and we ourselves, for an eternal kingdom. And friends, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are blessed with a message on true education that is the greatest, most profound, and most detailed message on education ever entrusted to the world. The principles, don't get me wrong, the principles of true education are as old as the world. <laughs> they were applied in the Garden of Eden. They, we see them in the life of Abraham and the children of Israel on through history. But it was made much more clear for our modern times through the pen of the spirit of prophecy. And I'm grateful for that. The principles are found in the Bible. They are for all people. Modern brain research, child psychology, educational um, research has substantiated these principles. But it is gratitude which motivates me to acknowledge there is a special added clarity given to this message on education through the pen of the Spirit of Prophecy. And while there are many books and topics and collections um, written on this topic, the book titled simply Education by far leads them all. I meant to bring my copy up here. I carry one in my backpack and study some from it every chance I get. How many have read the book Education cover to cover? Wow, that's a surprisingly high number. Uh, I'm amazed, I'm constantly amazed how many of us have not read this book, but it is our textbook on true education. How do we expect to understand true education if we're not studying the textbook? This message God has given us. And this book has been hailed by educators worldwide as far ahead of its time. It has been used to reshape education in countries around the world. Let me just give you a, a couple of brief examples. Educational leaders in the state of Mysore, India, used the book Education to shape their philosophy of education shortly after gaining independence in 1947. Secular leaders recognized the value of this book. I'm told that during a time of significant change to the educational system in the nation of Ghana, Africa, educational leaders, Seventh-day Adventist educational leaders, were visiting the Secretary of Education for the nation of Ghana. And they saw on the Secretary of Education's desk a well-worn copy of the book Education. And they said, oh, interesting. Have you been reading that book? And he looked at them and he said, this is the source of the changes we're making in our educational system. 
Professor John Michalis, the University of Berkeley, California, stated the book Education was 50 years ahead of its time, and that if he had known of it, he wouldn't have needed to write his own book on education. A friend of mine was perusing the bookshelves of a, of a bookstore. I don't remember the details of where it was, what the bookstore was. Um, but she was in the, the section on education, and she noticed the book Education there on the shelf of the bookstore. And beside her was a distinguished gentleman. And as they perused the shelves together, they struck up a, struck up a conversation. Turns out he was a leading professor of education in the area. And as they came through the books, he noticed the book Education. He mentioned it. And he mentioned to my friend, have you read this book? Well, she being Seventh-day Adventist, she had read the book. She goes, yeah, I have read it, actually. What do you think of it? Have you read it? He goes, oh, yes, I've read it. This is an amazing book. He said, if, if the world would just follow this, if schools would just read this, we would transform education. And Dr. Florence Stratemeyer of Columbia University, world-leading curriculum authority, Roman Catholic by religion, also stated she found the book to be 50 years ahead of its time. She was asked one time to give a lecture on education to a group of Seventh-day Adventist teachers. Her source for the principles of education laid out in her talk was none other than the book Education. She stated, the breadth and depth of its philosophy amazed me. Its concept of balanced education, harmonious development, and of thinking and acting on principle are advanced educational concepts. The objective of restoring in man the image of God, of, teaching of par the teaching of parental responsibility and the emphasis on self-control in the child are ideals the world desperately needs. Friends, <laughs> The rocks are crying out, as it were. We should be supremely thankful for this precious resource. We should be on the edge of our seats, waiting to hear how God wants to tell us how to educate royalty. Because this work concerns our redemption, as we have read. Now, before we get in, I want to cover some of the principles of this message this morning. Before we get into that, it is important to make a clarification. When one says the term true education, what does that indicate by default? There must be a false education. If you say something's true, that indicates there must be a false. So what does it mean when we say there's true education? It indicates there must be a false education. But what is the primary difference? Are there really these two separate and distinct systems of education, or are they just kind of one system with some differences? The Bible tells us there's a great controversy. We all know that story, right? <laughs> a controversy between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. And at the head of the two kingdoms in the universe are two governments. And these two governments have principles of operation that are fundamentally different from each other. In fact, they are opposed to each other, at war with each other. Their foundational principles of operation are opposite. And because of this, each government will, of necessity, have its own educational system preparing citizens to function in its government because it would not be possible for one government's educational system to prepare citizens to function in the other government. That'd be counter and counterproductive, right? <laughs> Educating for the wrong system, for the wrong government. So there is a true education and a false education simply by the fact that there's a government of God and a government of Satan, that there is a great controversy. Education concerns our preparation to function in the government for which it is preparing us. Sometimes we tend to think of education as just filling the mind with information. But education is not merely informational. It is transformational. I think we're having a connection issue. them 
attend to that. I don't know if there's anything I need to do here. it's quiet, I can talk. <laughs> Education is not merely informational, it is transformational. And it doesn't matter which system of education we're a part of. We can be part of the false system, we will be transformed. We can be part of the true system, and we will be transformed. So the question really is, which system are we a part of, right? There's another statement that caught me made me think, from the Avanus Psalm, page 318, the reason why the youth of the present age are not more religiously inclined is, now I've paused right there, because this is the answer, I mean, this is the question we've been asking, right? This is something we want an answer for. Why are our youth not interested in spiritual things? Why are our youth leaving the church? Now, we could fill a library with the books that have been written on this topic. We could fill many, many messages, many of man's ideas. But what's God's answer? Do we want God's answer or man's answer? One of us wants God's answer. <laughs> God's answer hurts sometimes, doesn't it? The reason why the youth of the present age are not more religiously inclined is that their education is defective. This should make us think. This should make us ask the question, which system are our youth part of? A system of education preparing them for earth only? Or a system of education focused on preparation to be co-heirs with Jesus? So, what is true education? Let's take some time to explore some of these principles. It's a beautiful plan that God has given us, and certainly I cannot take uh, all the time I need for this class. I uh, actually was just in Bolivia a few weeks ago and had the privilege to have two weeks to cover this topic, almost 40 hours of classes. That was a lot of fun. So I won't put you through all 40 hours this morning. We'll start with just about 40 minutes. But there are three primary principles of this plan that God has given us. First of all, that true education and redemption are synonymous, as we've seen already from the book Education. It is to restore the image of God in the soul. Secondly, that it is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. And third, that it is preparation for service here and throughout eternity. We're going to work through these principles individually. So let's take this first one, to restore the image of God in the soul. As we've read from the book Education, in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are the same. So here's a standard of measurement we can use. As we're analyzing an educational program, an activity, we can say, is this focused on redemption? Is it preparation for heaven? The true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. All right, so if something needs to be restored, what does that tell you about its condition? What was that? It's broken. it's broken. Okay. It's not in its original condition. So what does this tell us? If the object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul, what does this tell us about the image of God in the soul right now in, in mankind? It's damaged. It's destroyed, right? The Spirit of Prophecy actually uses the word almost obliterated. <laughs> you almost can't see it as a result of sin. So something needs to be done to bring us back to that perfection in which we were created. And this is the plan of education. You see, God created man in his own image. Sin has destroyed it. And we are told that to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection at which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul. There's those three areas. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. That the divine purpose in his creation might be realized, this was to be the work of redemption. Now, pause there. We all know that, right? <laughs> 
restoring the image of God in the soul, that's the purpose of redemption. And if the paragraph stopped there, this would be nothing new to us. But it doesn't say only redemption. It says this is the object of education. In other words, our education should have the same focus as the plan of redemption. Our education should have the same focus as the plan of redemption. That should make us think, right? <laughs> what direction is my education going? What focus does it have? But then it adds something interesting. It says the great object <laughs> of life, of life. Our entire existence here on this earth should be focused on this restoration of the image of God in the soul, of restoring what God created but has been damaged by sin. So how do we do this? Again, I'm just touching some of the high points. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding, the Bible tells us. So, wisdom, understanding, these are educational terms. What does it tell us is the beginning of wisdom? In other words, where do we start? The fear of the Lord, okay? What is the fear of the Lord? What was that? Departing from evil. Okay, so recognizing his authority, recognizing his law, and the happiness and obedience to him. That is the beginning of wisdom. That's not the sum total, but that's where we start. A recognition of who God is, his authority, happiness in following his way. But then it tells us that's the beginning of wisdom, but if we want to have understanding, what do we need? A knowledge of the holy. Knowledge of the holy. What is a knowledge of the holy? The Bible's term, the, the word here used in the Bible, knowledge, you know, in this day and age, when we hear the word knowledge, what do we think of? Wikipedia. Wikipedia. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> information, right? <laughs> Just putting information in the mind. I know about something. Is that what the Bible's referring to when it says a knowledge of the holy is understanding? You just know who God is? You have some information about him? No. To the Hebrew mind, when the word knowledge is used, this is referring not to information about something, but connection with somebody. Intimate connection. A verse probably we know well from Genesis. Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. Connection with someone. The plan of true education is based in relationship. Relationship, first of all, with God himself. And as we know him, as we connect with him, as we're in communion with him, he wants to be in this communion with us. And here we will gain understanding. For any parents who are here listening, where does this begin? You might say, this is a little abstract for my four-year-old. <laughs> it begins in the mother's arms. We're told the parents represent the character of God to the child. As the parents develop a relationship with their little one, they pave the way for them to have this knowledge of the holy, which is true education. Now we need to lay a foundation. The very foundation we read of true education is in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Foundation. This is an interesting term. How many here have built a house? Anyone? A couple of you, okay. You know how it's done at least, even if you haven't built one. Suppose you were going to build a house and uh, you realized that you didn't have money for the entire house. And so as you made plans to build your house, you decided you had to leave something off. Well, what can I leave off of my house? Um, walls. Can you leave the walls out of a house? Pretty essential, right? A roof. Definitely need that. Hmm. Paint. Maybe I could leave paint off the house. I mean, that's not really essential. Oh, but I don't want to leave paint off the house because then people will think my house is ugly. I can't have that. Flowers, landscaping. Could I leave that off? Ah, but again, people are going to think my house is ugly. So what is something I could leave off of this building project that no one will see? 
foundation, great idea. No one will see that I don't have a foundation. People will think my house is beautiful and I'll save some money. So you build that house without a foundation. Will people see you don't have a foundation? Technically, no. <laughs> but eventually, yes. They'll see the results of a lack of foundation, right? Let's apply this to education. We have a tendency, because of the world's pressures in education, to focus on the external. We focus on the performance, the grades, the honors, the, you know the list, right? It's what people can see that we think determines the value of the education. And we tend to apply this even into spiritual things. We think if that child can come up front and recite their memory verse or do a special music, great, they have a good character. No, no, that's just flowers. <laughs> that's just paint on the walls. Foundation. It says the very foundation of true education is in the fear of the Lord. The foundation is something by nature that no one can see. So when and where is the foundation laid? First of all, in the home, right? With the instruction of father and mother, in the, that building of relationship, in the teaching of the things of God, in the family worship, but not just the family worship, in every day, all day, as Deuteronomy lays it out, walking, talking, sitting, lying down, the words that are in the parents' hearts are naturally imparted to the children as they spend time together. People might not see that. People may not notice. They may not look and say, wow, what a great education that child is getting. But the time will come when the results will show for the worth of the foundation that was laid. Now, what is our guide in laying this foundation? We read the Bible should be made the foundation of education. So this is our help. This is our guide in laying the foundation. The Bible should be made the foundation of study and teaching. So this tells us it's not only in the home. It's in the school also. We're told the Bible should be the child's first textbook. From this book, parents are to give wise instruction. The Word of God is to be made the rule of life. One of my favorite statements from the book Education tells us instead of confining their study to that which men have said or written, let the students be directed to the sources of truth. How many times do we, do, do we direct our students to the things that someone else has said about the Bible instead of taking them to the Bible itself, teaching them to study, to think? Let's go to the source. Connected with this, sorry, I'm just, I'm just hitting a lot of points here, some various aspects from the Spirit of Prophecy on this on this lesson of redemption and true education, we read the first great lesson in true education is to know and understand the will of God. The book Education, page 267, gives us three steps to understand that. I encourage you to go study them. To know and understand the will of God. Are we teaching our children that? Do we make that their goal? Are you seeking the will of God for today, every morning? That begins with our devotional life. Are we teaching that to our students? Are you seeking the will of God daily for your life today and for your life's calling and for eternity? This, should be, this isn't a secondary lesson. It says this is the first great lesson. One of my favorites, by some, education is placed next to religion. But true education is religion. Many times we're, we, we take Bible class to be the sum total of religious education, but no, in God's plan, it's integrated. It is a plan that is integrated completely. Every aspect of our education should be focused on preparing us for heaven. True education is religion. We don't have time to continue in that point. Let's move quickly to our second aspect, that true education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. Harmonious development, physical, mental, and spiritual. God created us with three parts of our being, physical, mental, and spiritual. What part of these three areas does worldly education usually focus on? Mental, right. There's often a lack of harmonious development. What does harmonious mean? Well-rounded, well okay. 
complementary, balanced. We, th we can think of this in the term or in the context of music. Who loves a good quartet? Quartets are amazing, right? So you listen to a quartet and all of a sudden that tenor decides to sing more loudly than everyone else. Is it harmonious anymore? No, because it's out of balance, right? So a balanced development of physical, mental, and spiritual powers. And that comes directly from the Spirit of Prophecy, Education, page 13, that true education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. So let's talk about these individually. Physical training. Physical training, mental culture, and spiritual development. We read, both mental and spiritual vigor are, in a great degree, dependent upon physical strength and activity. Whatever promotes physical health promotes the development of a strong mind and a well-balanced character. Okay, all three areas are mentioned here, mental, spiritual, and physical. But it tells us that there are two areas dependent upon another. Which ones? It says mental and spiritual are dependent on physical. Now, I want to do an illustration of this. My good brother Tony, can you come help me? And uh, is it? Homer? Yeah. Can you help me? Yeah. All right. I need both of you up here. Let's stand over here. One of you on each side of me. We're going to do a demonstration of what we're just reading about here. It says mental and spiritual are dependent on physical. So for sake of illustration, we're going to have Homer. Thank you. <laughs> Homer representing mental. I'm going to represent physical, and Tony's going to represent spiritual. Now, I want you to both to put your arms on my shoulders, support yourself against me. Now lift up the leg closest to me so you're really leaning on me. Go ahead. Lift, lift up the leg closest to me. Oh, lift. Yeah, lift it up. Yeah, there we go. All right. Now, these two guys are leaning on me, right? We have spiritual, uh, sorry, mental and spiritual dependent on physical. This is what we've just read about. If you have a problem with this, you'll have to just go talk to God because this is how he created it. This is how our being functions. Mental and spiritual dependent on physical. Now, what would happen if I just jumped out of the way right now? They're getting worried. No, <laughs> I won't do that. The whole thing would collapse, right? The system would not be, um, it wouldn't work anymore. So if we want strong spiritual and strong mental powers, where do we need to start? With the physical, right? All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate the illustration. We want strong mental powers, right? We want our students to do well. We want strong spiritual powers. Where do we start? And this is fascinating because the Spirit of Prophecy tells us in the early education of children, many parents and teachers fail to understand that the greatest attention needs to be given to the what? Physical constitution that a healthy condition of body and brain may be secured. So where do we begin? And the, pair this also with the council in the first eight or 10 years of life, the child's classroom should be the open air, and there's the, the mother's should be the teacher, and there's so much research that, that supports this now. God created us this way, and the science is backing this up. Physical, physical activity has been found to improve the overall mental health and quality of life to enhance brain function and cognition, to improve behavior, improve concentration, increase the blood and oxygen flow to the brain, increase the levels of norepinephrine and endorphins, which result in a reduction of stress and an improvement of mood, to increase growth factors that help create new nerve cells and support synaptic plasticity from the Journal of the American Medical Association of Pediatrics. What a list, right? And this is just a start <laughs> into the huge number of benefits of physical activity. And God told us in the spirit of prophecy, if you want strong mental powers, if you want strong spiritual powers, lay a good foundation in the physical development. Exercise provides an unparalleled stimulus, creating an environment in which the brain is ready, willing, and able to learn. <clears throat> but does this stop with childhood? Do we just lay a good foundation and then as the, as the child grows and enters young adulthood, they can stop getting any physical activity? <laughs> no, this is important for all ages. In fact, we're told that the time should be divided. The study should be divided between the gaining of book knowledge and a securing of a knowledge of practical work. This is speaking of the context of youth in our schools. Dividing the time. What does it mean to divide the time? 
half and half, right? Equal portions. And this is supported by science and other, elsewhere in the spirit of prophecy. Physical training has three important components. Useful work, manual training, and agriculture. Useful work. Anyone give me some examples of useful work? Cleaning. Cleaning all right. <laughs> Chores. Washing dishes, gardening, yeah, gardening certainly falls into the agriculture category, but certainly falls into useful work and manual training. Those basic duties of the home, you know, it's amazing how many college graduates don't know how to clean their own bathroom. <laughs> Practical stuff that we need to be teaching, and this should start in childhood, of course, and should continue um, as, a, as a habit as the, the age advances. And we also read that the greatest benefit is not gained from exercise that's taken as play or exercise merely. There's some benefit in being in the fresh air and also from the exercise of the muscles, but let the same amount of energy be given to the performance of useful work and the benefit will be greater. I'm sure I don't have to point out, but what do we usually focus on in worldly plans of education? If there's a physical component, what is it? Sports, gymnastics, right? Things that are competitive, first of all, against the principles of God's kingdom. And second of all, they're just exercise for the sake of exercise. Now, it doesn't say we should never exercise for the sake of exercise, but it just says that's not where we'll find the greatest benefit. But <laughs> there's a key here. It says, let the same amount of energy be given to the performance of useful work. Anyone ever seen some young people playing soccer? Or not so young? How much energy goes into that game of soccer? A lot of energy, right? Running, jumping, kicking, yelling. And now it's time to weed the garden. How much energy? For some reason, the energy's gone. So we're not going to find the greatest benefit in that, right? Which means to me that we need to be educating about the value of useful work, right? It's not just you have to do this now, it's what you have to do now. No, we should be teaching about the importance and the value of spending time in useful work work. And we're told it is part of the training essential for every youth. An important phase of education is lacking if the student is not taught how to engage in useful labor. Every man, woman, and child should be educated to practical useful work. A second component of physical training is manual training. This goes beyond just useful work to where we're actually training a skill or a trade. We're told that Manual training is deserving of far more attention than it has received. If we look at the nation of Israel, it was considered a fundamental part of their education. Every young person, no matter how rich they were, was taught a practical, useful trade. It was part of their education and their character development. Every youth on leaving school should have acquired a knowledge of some trade or occupation by which, if need be, he may earn a livelihood. Okay, so let's clarify here. They're learning the practical, everyday duties of caring for a home, useful work. Then we add to that manual training, where we're training a specific skill or a trade so that that young person can graduate with that trade. Whether or not they're going to use it doesn't matter. The fact that they've been educated in that to be able to then fall back on that if they need it is the important part. And we also know it is part of character and development. Now, the third area of physical development that's very important is agriculture. We're told no line of manual training is of more value than agriculture. I don't have time to get into all the benefits of agriculture, but it is definitely a school that the Lord has given us. Right, Tony? You think so? I thought so. <laughs> now, gardening has been found by the science to be extremely beneficial, especially for children. Gardening has been found to build self-confidence and self-esteem in children. It teaches them to be more patient and persevering. Now, <laughs> when I read that, I said, did we need a million-dollar study to tell us that? Uh, you, ca you can't get this smartphone here, press a few buttons, and out come tomatoes. It just doesn't work that way. You have to plant them and care for them and water them and weed them and pray over them. And with the Lord's blessing, you'll get some tomatoes. So yes, of course, it teaches patience and perseverance. Improve science understanding. They actually, children have better test scores when they're involved in gardening and they were overall better learners. One study found an experimental group of gardening students outperformed the control group of non-gardening students in all areas 
general information, reading recognition, reading comprehension, Torah reading, mathematics, spelling, and written language. What a list. And what does this have to do with gardening? Nothing really. But the fact that they were involved in the gardening strengthened the mind so that they did better in these things. And uh, unfortunately, for sake of time, I'm going to have to move through here. But Mycobacterium vacai, how many have heard of this one? A few. Uh, it's becoming a little more well known. This is a powerful bacteria. You can see on the slide here all the benefits that it has for our body. We find this in the soil in which we grow our gardens. Putting your hands in the soil, eating the vegetables out of the soil, it actually is good for our health. Can we learn some academic things in the garden? Any math to be found in the garden? Easily, right? Any science to be found in the garden? Most certainly. So this is not only an opportunity just to learn gardening, but there's a lot of other things that can be taught through it. In fact, we're told the Garden of Eden was not only Adam's dwelling, but his schoolroom. We're also told the study in agricultural lines should be the A, B, and C of the educational work of our school. This is the very first work that must be entered upon. This is fundamental. And we need to view this as a fundamental part of education. It doesn't matter whether the program makes money, is financially viable. Those, those considerations have been a consideration in the past for us, but they really shouldn't be because it is fundamental to education according to the Lord's plan. But now I hasten on here. Physical training. A uh, second component of this is mental culture. Now the world focuses on this heavily. I, heavily. I don't think we need encouragement to mental culture, but it's important to define the type of mental culture that we need. Because the world focuses on getting the right grades and getting all the honors and getting your degree and your title and, and uh, building this up in a very self-centered, informational type of way. Certainly the Christian can have high attainments. We should, but for a different purpose. We're told he is a Christian who aims to reach the highest attainments. Why? For the purpose of doing others good. What are we called to on this earth? We're called to be missionaries. We're called to benefit others. And our education should fit us for this work. It's interesting to contrast this with the false methods of education as outlined in the book Studies in Christian Education by E.A. Sutherland. Who's read that book? All right, a few. Excellent. Powerful book that contrasts true and false education from the days of the Protestant Reformation. And E.A. Sutherland speaks of the work of the Counter-Reformation through the work of the Jesuits that opposed the work of the Protestant Reformation through schools. Uh, they recognized that one of their greatest tools to oppose the work of the, of the Reformation was through schools. And it's interesting to look at the methods they use. The following methods are, of teaching are characteristic of the Jesuit schools. Again, speaking of the time of the Counter-Reformation, I'm sure we could apply this today, though. The memory was cultivated as a means of keeping down or suppressing free activity of thought and clearness of judgment. It sought showy results with which to dazzle the world. A well-rounded development was nothing. The Jesuits did not aim at developing all the faculties of their pupils. When a student could make a brilliant display from the resources of a well-stored memory, he had reached the highest points to which the Jesuits sought to lead him. Originality and independence of mind, love of truth for its own sake, the power of reflecting and forming correct judgments were not merely neglected, they were suppressed in the Jesuit system. Need I make the connections <laughs> to education today? Can we see these methods still being followed? Why? It was to suppress good thinking abilities. Now let's contrast this with what the spirit of prophecy tells us. It is not well to crowd the mind with studies that require intense application, but that are not brought into use in practical life. Such an education will be a loss to the student. It is not even enough, enough even to have knowledge. We must have the ability to use the knowledge aright. And again, this is a major difference between true and false education. We often think of education just as gaining the knowledge and someday I'll put it into practice. But in God's plan of education, what is learned is put into practice, specifically in missionary effort. <clears throat> Spiritual development, again, a, um, 
something, we've covered this already in, in its relation to redemption. Let's just have the reminder that a character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure we can take from this world to the next. How important then is the development of character in this life? We need to focus on character. We need to focus on preparation for heaven. This is our ultimate goal. Any effort that exalts intellectual culture above moral training is misdirected. So there's a balance, uh, but one should lead, and that is moral development. In our remaining couple of minutes, let's touch on our third and final point of true education, and that is preparation for service here and throughout eternity. Again, this principle comes from the book Education, that true education prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. True education is, who likes definitions? <laughs> Let's make this simple, right? What is true education? How could we finish this sentence based on what we've learned so far? We could say it is harmonious development of physical, mental, and spiritual. We could say it is uh, redemption. It is restoration of the image of God in the soul. A lot of things that we could fill in the blank here. True education is, what does it tell us here? Anyone want to guess? Harmonious development, all right, we've mentioned that one. Missionary training. Missionary training. I don't know how much more simple you can get. True education is missionary training. This should be our goal. Every son and daughter of God is called to be a missionary. We are called to the service of God and our fellow men, and to fit us for this service should be the object of our education. This is our goal. This is our purpose here on this earth. We are called to be missionaries. We are called to finish the work on this earth. God wants to prepare us for this work through our education so that Jesus can come soon. I want to back up to a statement that I skipped because I wanted to connect it with what we just read. Going back to that papal system of education, we read again from Studies in Christian Education from E.A. Sutherland, the papal system of education makes teachers content to repeat set lessons to their students as they themselves learn them in school with no thought of making practical application. The students in turn go out to teach others the same rote they have learned and thus the endless treadmill goes on ever learning but never getting anywhere. Does the Bible have a statement about this too? ever learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Friend God's, friends, God wants our education to be practical, applicable, and focused on finishing the work on this earth. Because Satan would be happy for this treadmill to go on for eternity. He knows that when God's people have true education, which is focused on finishing the work on this earth, then the world will end and he'll be finished. He doesn't want that. Our education needs to have a focus and a purpose. True education is missionary training. And we read, it is necessary to their complete education that students be given time to do missionary work. So we don't just hope that they do some missionary work during their school breaks. It should be part of the program, focused on preparing them as missionaries and putting them to work as missionaries. But does this mean going to Africa every week? <laughs> That'd get impractical, wouldn't it? What kind of missionary work? Time to become acquainted with the spiritual needs of the families in the community around them. This word acquaintance is key. Book education, it's in the 270s, I don't remember the page. It says, it is acquaintance that awakens sympathy. And sympathy is the spring of an effective ministry. How are we going to awaken sympathy and a desire for missionary effort in our young people? We need to put them in acquaintance with the needs around them. They need to be in contact, developing relationships with, those, with the needs around them, and that will motivate them to an effective ministry. And then there is a place for foreign mission service. Let's add that. From our colleges and training schools, missionaries are to be sent forth to distant lands. While at school, let the students improve every opportunity to prepare for this work. So it's preparation while in school for missionary work, engaging in missionary work in the communities around them, and then as they graduate, they're going forth, and we can finish this work, and Jesus can come. 
Friends, now as never before, we need to understand this message of true education. It is urgent. It is vital for our entrance to the kingdom of God. It was the year 1938. Drs. Toshio Yamagata and Elder Francis Millard of the Japan Union Mission were visiting Dr. Mizuno, the leader of social and religious education for the nation of Japan. 1938, those of you who know your history know this was a time in Japan Many of the religious and parochial schools were being closed throughout the nation. The men were there from the Adventist mission visiting this government leader to ask permission to keep their school open. They explained to the government leader on heaven. We're also focused on preparing good citizens harmonious development of physical, mental, and spiritual. And they explained their plan to this government leader. And they said, actually, <laughs> if you want to understand our plan, you could just read this book. And they handed him the book Education. You could just read this book. Dr. Mizuno held up his hand. He said, that's okay. I don't need to read your book. I already read it. I know your plan. And I'll tell you this. If you follow your plan as it's laid out in that book, you have no reason to worry. You can keep your school open. We need more schools like that. But if you don't follow that plan, as outlined in your book, we'll shut you down because you have no reason to exist. Friends, this is our reason to exist. And God has given us a plan that affects every area of our lives. It is a plan that may generate ridicule, a plan that will set us apart from the world. But friends, light is light because it's different from the darkness. We will be effective as a people when we recognize the value of our plan and we seek to follow it without copying the ways of the world. This is our reason to be here, our method to finishing the work so that Jesus can come. Let's fulfill our reason to exist.